Well, hello everybody. Good evening and welcome. I am Frances Hellman, Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences in the College of Letters and Science at UC Berkeley and a professor of physics. I really do wish we were all meeting in person, but the silver lining to these virtual events is that we can reach so many of our alumni and friends who moved away from the Bay Area. Bay Area. I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk about perhaps the most ex existential of all the topics this series is covering, the climate. Many of us on this call today are experiencing the warming of our planet rather directly as we are feeling the, uh, the effects of the fires and so forth uh, affecting our air. And my heart goes out to those people affected by the fires all over the state of California, in fact, all over the West Coast. Um, while we aren't discussing fire tonight, it's ultimately part of this incredibly broad topic. We will barely scratch the surface, but our aim here is to show you some of the great work and great researchers who are dedicating their lives to understanding the environment. And our aim is to show you that there is great urgency in this research. Though there is no time to spare in addressing issues around climate change, some of the foundational work being done at Berkeley is incredibly important to our understanding of what's happening and what will happen. And of course, we're educating the next generation of scientists who will be left with many facets of this giant problem. So this evening, we're gonna hear from three fantastic scientists who are making this leap by developing new theories and models that will help researchers around the world working to understand climate science. Our moderator this evening is David Romps, a Goldman Distinguished Chair in the Physical Sciences, Professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science, and Director of the Berkeley Atmospheric Sciences Center. David leads a group at UC Berkeley and at Albion L that uses theory, simulation, and observation of clouds and atmospheric dynamics to improve our understanding of Earth's climate. The phenomena studied include atmospheric dynamics, convection, turbulence, cloud dynamics, microphysics, and the interaction of clouds with Earth's climate. David is one of our bright and shining stars at Berkeley, and we're very pleased to have him moderating tonight. So over to you, David. Thank you, Francis. It, it really is a pleasure for me to be a, a part of this event. I mean, in a way, global warming is very simple. If we want to stop additional warming, we simply have to stop burning coal, oil, and gas and we have to electrify everything in our lives, our cars, our homes, our industry, and run them off of solar and wind and hydro and nuclear if you want it. But global warming affects everything. And so there's a lot we need to learn and understand in order to be good stewards of this hotter planet. Uh, and that's why I'm so excited to be able to hear from some of my colleagues today uh, who are pushing the envelope on what it is we know about the interactions between warming and biology on this planet. So we'll speak to three of them. Uh, it's Caroline Williams, Dipti Nayak, and Bethany Edwards. And we'll start today with Caroline Williams. Caroline is an associate professor of integrative biology here at the University of California, Berkeley. She combines field-based natural history and experiments with laboratory-based biochemistry and physiology to study how insects and other ectotherms respond to variable environments to predict how insect populations will change as a result of global warming. And much of our research focuses on uh, some of those changes taking place in wintertime. So Caroline, could you tell us a little something about your research and what you're working on? Thanks, David. So the um, California is home to the beautiful and really diverse Sierra Nevada mountain ranges. So these, um, this mountain range was nicknamed the Range of Light by John Muir in 1912. And it's really of critical importance to California, both as the source of much of the water for the state and also as an uh, um, archive of biodiversity. Snow cover in the Sierras fluctuates markedly from year to year, as you can see from these photos, which were taken on the same day of the year, June 22nd, in two subsequent years. Um, so you can see the dry year on the right. The snow is all melted and the willow has already leafed out by the end of June, whereas in wet years, there's still snow there buffering the ground. And as droughts become more common in California, um, 
due to a combination of decreased snow falling and also snow melting earlier in the year because of warming temperatures. Um, so as these um, droughts increase in frequency and severity, we're going to see more and more of the years on the right and less of the wet snowy years. So the story I'm going to tell you about today is about this charismatic little beetle, the Sierra willow leaf beetle or Chrysomella anacolis. So you can see he's a handsome little fellow. They're um, about the size of a ladybug beetle. So very small beetles, black with red spots. Um, very beautiful, I think. And they live in um, riverside willow habitat in these Sierra Nevada mountains between about 9,000 and 12,000 feet. So we work on um, populations that are at the southern range edge of the species range. Um, and the, this beetle is really interesting because it has a very winter adapted life cycle. So you can see the adults come out in July and they have to complete their development through the short growing season, reach the adult overwintering stage before the snows fall. And then they have this long winter dormancy, which they spend in diapause, which is the insect version of hibernation. Um, so they're, during that overwintering period, they're burrowed into the soil at the base of the willow plants. And so their um, environment is on a very small scale, quite different from the environment above the snow. Um, this is a really uh, nice, simple ecosystem, and there's been a long history of study on this species. So they're really the ideal um, canary in the coal mine, if you like, to understand the responses of cold adapted species to changes in snow cover. So my collaborators um, pictured here, Elizabeth Dalhoff and Nathan Rank, set up this long-term study site in the 1980s. So there are five replicated mountain transects in the Eastern Sierras, just out of Bishop, California. Um, and each summer, uh, Elizabeth and Nathan, and now myself and my PhD student, Kevin, go out. We um, count the beetle populations in the summer. Um, and uh, we have temperature loggers out, which measure the soil temperature right where the beetles are going to be overwintering. Um, all the way back to 2009, we have these hourly records. And we combine these detailed data on the natural history and the environmental conditions with information we get from the laboratory and from field experiments where we can manipulate the conditions and measure the beetles' responses. Um, and then we use these um, lab and field experiments and we build predictive models that can scale these observations of individual beetles up to the population level. Um, so the first really important thing that I want to tell you about today that my work aims to highlight is that snow is a really effective thermal buffer. So here you can see the snow depth. Here is where we get a very big snowfall. Um, and in this blue period, if we look at the temperatures underneath the willow where the beetles live, while that snow is deep, the temperature is very stable. What you can see before that snowfall is there are a lot of cold snaps in the soil that the beetles and all other organisms that live underneath the snow are going to have, or underneath the soil, are going to have to deal with. Um, and the temperatures here are dropping below minus five. They can even get um, significantly colder than that. So snow is an effective thermal buffer which determines, strongly determines the soil microclimate and effectively decouples air temperature from soil temperature. So this idea was first um, put into words by Peter Groffman in 2001 when he called it colder soils in a warmer world. As climate change causes earlier snow melt, the bare ground is counterintuitively going to be colder. So as we go up a mountain, this gets a bit more complicated because snow cover increases, but air temperature decreases as you go up the mountain. So at high elevations, it's cold but snowy. Um, and at lower elevations, it's relatively warm, but in a mountain ecosystem, it's still quite cold, but, and it's dry, so the ground is bare. So if we base our climate change predictions on air temperature, we might get some really misleading conclusions because we might think that it's colder at these very high elevations, but if snow is buffering the beetles there, um, that might reverse what we would predict. So I wanted to ask, how does declining snow cover impact beetle survival and then population dynamics across these mountain gradients? So from this long-term historical data set, we can look at how the range um, 
elevational range responds to snow. Um, so we can see the upper and lower elevational range limits here um, vary a lot. And these red bars on the bottom panel show long periods of drought. So if we look at these periods of drought, we can see that that lower elevational range contracts up the mountain during the long droughts. Um, and these range contractions may be driven by loss of snow cover. And you can see at um, some points, the populations at the southern range edge are actually winking out altogether. Um, so the work that we've done on my lab, in my lab has shown that cold stress might be driving these patterns. So a high um, number on the cold stress axis indicates that the beetles have a very high likelihood of encountering temperatures that are going to kill them based on what we know in the lab. Um, and particularly at these mid-high elevations where snow cover is um, there in snowy years but absent in dry years, we see a really abrupt increase in cold stress in these years of drought. Um, so at sites like this mid-elevation site below Ruby Lake, the increasing droughts are going to really um, stress the beetles by increasing the amount of cold, the cold snaps that they're experiencing due to the loss of that thermal buffering of snow. Um, in contrast, the high elevation habitats, which you can see here, are going to be relatively buffered from increases in cold stress because although it's colder up there, the snow is persistent through the whole winter. So the take home message is that climate change in, in winter is a bit more complicated than the simple idea of global warming might suggest. We have this counterintuitive um, result of colder soils in a warmer world because declining snow cover in regions like California will expose organisms that dwell in the soil to greater cold stress, potentially driving population declines. And we really depend on these organisms that live on the, um, in the soil. So they're, um, ter insects are the base of most terrestrial food webs and they're important as pollinators for a large amount of the food we eat. We can see the devastation that can be caused by in um, insect outbreaks in terms of forestry and agriculture. So by studying this little microcosm at the southern range edge of the species range, we can get, get a better understanding of how climate change is driving the extirpation or wiping out populations at the range edge where climate change is making conditions uninhabitable, um, which in turn can drive species range shifts. So hopefully we can use this information to prioritize areas that are critical for conservation of biodiversity in California and beyond. Thank you, I'd gl be glad to take questions. That's a wonderfully counterintuitive result that this warming could in some locations actually make it colder uh, for some of these organisms. Now I understand these these beetles are ectotherms, which means that they, I guess unlike us, they can't maintain a constant body temperature, uh, but they're more at the, at the whim of the ambient temperature around them, kind of like a, a, a lizard or a turtle or something like that. And so my understanding from chemistry is that reactions tend to proceed faster at higher temperatures. And so is it right that these beetles would be, in general, have a higher metabolism when they're exposed to the warmer temperatures. Uh, so is, is global warming something of a diet plan for these beetles and other ectotherms? And what are the implications of that? Yeah, absolutely. That's another aspect that my lab is really interested in, is how um, changes in temperatures over winter are going to um, change the energy um, conservation strategies of insects and other ectothermic or cold-blooded animals. Um, so you're right that when um, snow is there, although they're protected from these cold snaps, their metabolism is running faster. So just like if you operate your car with your foot on the gas pedal all the time, you might run out of gas before you get to where you need to go. And we are seeing that in our beetles that um, in the because we do some experiments where we bury caged beetles and we either allow snow to accumulate on the plot or we exclude the snow so that there, there's a sort of artificial manipulation of snow. In those plots with the snow on top of them, the beetles are dying from running out of energy, just like you suggested. So it's not all as simple as snow is good, drought is bad. Um, the snow brings its own unique challenges. 
And one thing that we're actually really interested in is how there could be some individuals and populations that are better um, adapted through their genetic makeup to cope with snowy, energetically demanding conditions. And different individuals may actually be better adapted to cope with dry conditions, um, which are cold, but not energetically demanding. So then we've got the potential for sort of rapid evolution um, of these cold, cold and energetic responses that might sort of rescue populations from rapid climate change. So the warming that we're causing now is uh, almost geologically unprecedented in, in terms of the pace with which we're warming the planet. And one of the concerns I have is just how quickly ecosystems can can shift. How, how, and um, these beetles, they're small. Uh, I don't know how far they, they fly, um, but how, how can they keep up with the shift of their habitat, in, with, just with respect to temperature at least, to higher latitudes and higher altitudes? Yeah, absolutely. The um, ease or distance that organisms can disperse are going to determine whether they can keep up with their climate niche. Um, and beetles are somewhere in the middle, I guess. They're, um, they have wings so they can fly, but they don't really do it very often. You know, I've seen a beetle fly a sum total of one time in the sort of seven years that I've been going out there into the Sierras. And when it did, it flew extremely energetically. And we see from the genetic data that there is gene flow across these mountain ranges, suggesting that beetles can fly, but I don't think they do very often. So then in terms of their irregular life cycle, they're spending most of their life on one willow plant and then their children will grow up on that plant. They eat the same host plant. So I think that that's one of the vulnerabilities of these particular beetles that um, they can't really move far enough and they're gonna run out of mountain. So they can move up slope but at some point the, the willow runs out. And so when you've got a restriction like a geographic barrier or fragmented habitat, then that combines with the dispersal limitations to prevent organisms from keeping up. So that's where we're gonna see declines. And to be clear, it's not just this beetle as charismatic as it, it looks to me. Uh, there are knock-on consequences. I mean, who feeds on these things what, what impact does it have or, or other representative uh, insects have on the food web there? So the food web in the mountains is really simple. The main predator of the beetles is a wasp, which lays its eggs in the growing beetles in the larvae. Um, and the willow, of course, which the beetle eats, but the beetle doesn't have a major impact on killing all the willow or anything like that. So we think of this as, um, just a, a simplified ecosystem with only a few sort of links in it that we can um, see how that um, how that ecosystem is responding to climate change. But I think you can think of it as a, a model for any soil dwelling cold blooded organism. And, and if you're able to identify these these places as being particularly vulnerable because maybe this beetles in this kind of Goldilocks place where it has to have just the right amount of snow, but not too cold, not too hot. Um, if you're able to identify these places, what can we do for them? I mean, global warming is hard to put the brakes on anything other than from a global perspective. What can we do in an adaptation kind of way to help out these ecosystems? Mm. So the um, one project that, that I'm involved in is the California Conservation Genomics Program, which is a statewide effort aimed at um, doing genome sequencing on um, over 100 species of ecological importance, of which our beetle is one. And there the aim is to look across the state and look where the genetic diversity is concentrated. That's sort of the reservoir that might allow organisms to be buffered from negative effects of climate change. And if we can identify habitats which hold a lot of genetic diversity and target conservation efforts at those habitats and an increase, increasing corridors and connections between those habitats, then we can make our um, ecosystems more resilient to the negative impacts of climate change. And I guess as a final question, are there directions you're hoping that this research is going to take you or are there other organisms you're you're studying or what, what comes next? 
So I think although it's wonderful to have this one species that we know so much about, we can't get this level of information for most species. So one of the things I think about a lot is, can we identify some characteristics of species that make them sort of winners or losers of climate change? So there we can think about traits, intrinsic traits of the species like you know, what life stage do they overwinter in? Are they sort of warm blooded or cold blooded? Um, you know, the big things that will impact sensitivity. And then we can think about exposure. So who is living in habitats that are going to change a lot? And importantly, do those changes bring them close to physiological tolerance thresholds? So it might be fine for have, to have four degrees of warming if you're currently too cold. If you're already right up against the limits of your heat tolerance, then that four degrees is going to push you right over. So, yeah, trying to establish some general principles that we can use to assess all species everywhere. That would be the big picture to, to target our interventions on the most vulnerable. That, that would be incredibly valuable information to have. Uh, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, Caroline. Uh, we're going to uh, shift gears here just a little bit, and we're going to talk to Dipti Nayak. Uh, Dipti Nayak is an assistant professor of genetics, genomics, and development in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, and her research interests intersect microbial physiology and evolution. Her team is developing exciting new models for understanding methanogenic and methanotrophic archaea, uh, methane generating and methane eating little critters, the primary producers and consumers of methane. Her lab's work on these organisms are key to designing optimized solutions for managing the effects of methane emissions. So Dipti, uh, can you tell us a little something about your research and what you're working on? Yes, uh, I'd be delighted to. Thank you so much for that introduction, David. And I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this event. Um, and with that, let me get my slides up. Okay. So can everyone see my slide? Yes, okay, I got a thumbs up. So let's get going. Um, I think one thing that I've commonly noticed is that when we talk about climate change, um, it's become synonymous with rising CO2 levels. And it's becoming more and more clear that there are other players involved and they're almost just as important. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about methane, uh, which is the second most abundant greenhouse gas in our atmosphere, um, and also a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So every molecule of methane that's being emitted uh, will stick around in the atmosphere for at least a few decades. And over the time course of a few decades, which is what we should be thinking about now, that one molecule of methane will have 100 times the heat trapping potential of a molecule of CO2. Uh, what's particularly alarming about methane are these trends that I'm showing you here. So in the last five years or so, there has been a very steady and very steep increase in the amount of methane that's kind of collecting in our atmosphere. And this is especially troubling when we think about the Paris agreements and the goals that we have planned to mitigate the effects of climate change. So our goals for the next few decades are to you know, lower or to keep the temperature increase to about 1.5 degrees Celsius. The models that we've built for this actually assume that the methane levels over the course of the next couple of decades are going to decrease by 35%. And that decrease is not at all reflected in what's happening. What's happening is the complete opposite. The methane levels are rising and rising fast. So what that means is that if we meet all of our goals for CO2 emissions, we're still derailing you know, our plans to mitigate climate change in the near future, because we're not thinking about this other greenhouse that's gas that's suddenly rising to the fore and might lead to an imminent crisis. And that gas here is methane. Uh, so when we think about methane now, we should think about you know, policies and technology that's at the scale and scope of the problem that methane is going to be very soon. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have anything for that. Um, you probably see in the news that, you know, we should be eating less dairy or beef, but that's just not at the scale or scope of the problem that we're dealing with. So what my lab does is we're looking at the heart of this problem and trying to understand where is this methane coming from and where is it going? 
And what I want to convince you today that this problem is intrinsically one of our biologists, because most of this methane is being produced and consumed by different biological organisms. And so before I delve deeper into what my lab does, I want to introduce you to some of these players by talking to you about the methane cycle at large. Um, so first, I want to tell you a little bit about where all of this methane is coming from. And there's two predominant sources. Uh, one is one of these critters that David mentioned uh, called methanogens. So these are small microscopic organisms that are called methanogens because they respire by making methane the same way we make CO2 gas. Um, they're present essentially anywhere you look. Um, most famously, maybe of late, um, they're present in cows. So when you think about cows making methane, it's not the cow that's making the methane. A healthy cow's gut has a lot of these methanogens, and it's these little critters that make the methane in a cow. Um, and what's, I guess, important to think about at a global scale is living in all of these different places, um, often invisible to the eye, these organisms are contributing about 80% of all the methane that's showing up in the atmosphere. And then the rest of the methane um, is coming from some chemical and geological processes. But it's, it's a much smaller fraction than being made by these methanogens. So luckily for us, not all of this methane makes its way into the atmosphere because some of it gets consumed before it finds its way there. So let's look at the other side. Where does all the methane go? Um, so there's two groups of organisms that consume methane. Uh, first are these methanotrophic bacteria, which consume methane only in environments where oxygen is present. The, another group um, that is called ANME, uh, which is a short for anaerobic methane oxidizing archaea, which is quite a mouthful. So let's just call them ANME for now. These are the most predominant methane consumers. Um, they grow in the absence of oxygen and they consume about 50% of the total methane that's produced by the methanogens, those methane producing microbes, as well as the chemical and geological sources that I told you previously. So if I sum up what I just mentioned to you in the last two slides, I think what becomes clear if you wanna think about methane and if you wanna think about methane in the context of climate change is that there's these two groups of organisms that really rise to the fore and are the ones we should be thinking about these methanogens and these animes that are on both ends. And what's particularly fascin fascinating to me as a molecular biologist is when I look a little further into the cells of these organisms. Now, I don't wanna get into the details of these slides, uh, but on the left here in pink, uh, what I'm showing you is how these methane producers make methane. And on the right, I'm showing you how these methane consumers consume methane. And what I want you to take away is that the process the steps involved are identical in the two systems. So what's particularly fascinating is it's the same process on both ends. One group of organisms uses it to make methane and the other to break it down. So what we hope to understand in our lab is this one single process that's essentially controlling the net flux of methane on our planet. Um, and what we're doing is bringing CRISPR technology to this problem. Um, I'm extremely fortunate to be on this campus where CRISPR technology was developed. And it has many different roles outside of human health, particularly now in terms of thinking about how it can be used to alleviate climate change. So one, from a basic science standpoint, one really important question that we are addressing in my lab is, what makes these two groups of organisms different? What makes the pink bug make methane with, one, with that process that I just mentioned? Whereas the same process in that orange bug helps the organism consume methane. What, what sets the two apart. And then the next thing, as we understand some of these principles, what we're hoping to do is take that knowledge and use that maybe in ways to engineer communities in cows so that we're not changing anything, we're just taking these methanogens and making them make something else apart from methane and keeping the cows healthy, or maybe even taking these marshes, um, modifying the community slightly so that instead of producing methane, we can take those same organisms and essentially turn the lever around and have them consume methane with the ultimate goal to essentially alleviate the amount of methane that's being produced and sequester it and use it, maybe even usefully in some form. Um, so those are the kind of grand, that's the grand vision of the lab. And we're slowly kind of making progress towards that. Um, so thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions.
That was wonderful, Dipti. Truly fascinating. Uh, so, you know, I, what I find so interesting about this in part is that, you know, when someone asks me, where does methane come from? I say, well, it comes from, there's leakage from our fossil fuel infrastructure. I say it comes from landfills, it comes from cows' guts, it comes from rice paddies. But I don't think about the biology when I say that. I just think of those as the sources, but really those are the environments in which these, and I call them critters, but maybe microbes would have been a better word, or bacteria, or archaea, uh, where they uh, are able to generate methane. And you, you talked about three different kinds. You talked about the methanogens that are generating the methane, and then two types of microbes, methanotrophs and these amnes uh, that are consuming the methane. And could you uh, just remind us again where I should think about these three classes of microbes as living on it. Where would I go find these things if I had a, a microscope powerful enough to, to see them? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, David. So, but I think you can essentially go anywhere and you'll probably find them. Um, that's, I think, the beauty is that they're everywhere, but they're mostly invisible. Um, so I think one place, you don't really have to go too far. Um, so these methanogens, for instance, are present in our own human gut microbiota. Um, so they're a huge part of our uh, gut microbiome. Um, about 10% of our distal gut, which is kind of the large part of the large intestine, um, has methanogens. So humans actually produce a decent amount of methane and that kind of does not ever get factored into the emissions. Uh, so at least for the methanogens, they're present in any environment that you can think of, which is la lacking in oxygen or has you know, strongly depleted, is strongly depleted in oxygen if it's not completely absent. Um, the methanotrophs, um, as I mentioned, there's two. There are those bacteria um, that only grow in the presence of oxygen. And again, that's the only constraint there. If there's oxygen, you'll often find them as long as there's enough methane. And they typically live, because methane is such a small gas, it in, kind of diffuses across in many ecosystems. So you don't have to look too far to find it. Um, and then the anime, uh, initially they were only found in these extreme kind of um, environments, kind of at the bottom of the oceans near what we call hydrothermal vents, near these kind of, um, that, you know, there's hot, super hot liquid that's at temperatures greater than 100 C and pressures that are kind of mind boggling that's kind of coming out from the bottom of the earth. Uh, but now we've actually, thanks to genomic techniques, we found them, you know, in pretty not so exotic environments. There's a good question in the chat room here. We, it's kind of frustrating that these methanogens are generating so much methane and we're providing so many more opportunities for them to do so. But the question in the chat room is, why do they do it at all? What's in it for them to generate methane? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So they do it because it's their only means of livelihood. So that, that process that I mentioned is intrinsically coupled in these organisms to the production of um, ATP, which is an energy currency that the cell makes so that it can kind of do different kinds of reactions in the cell. But the process is also coupled to the production of intermediates that the cell needs to produce to divide and you know form a daughter cell. So all of those processes are intrinsically coupled to the production of methane, which is why it's so essential in those cells. And so one of the goals you mentioned here is to, I guess, understand how they're operating and uh, maybe even manipulate how they're operating. Uh, are there, I guess, are there ways, I, I want to get to the, to the modification with, with CRISPR because that's fascinating. Are there ways that we can use an understanding of how it is they are generating methane or how the methanotrophs or archaea, the enemies, are, um, are consuming the methane that would allow us to manipulate the environments of a landfill, of a cow's gut, of a, of a rice paddy to promote one behavior compared to another without even applying any sort of novel uh, organisms to that environment? Yeah, so one thing that people have tried is they've tried to eliminate these methane producers in a cow's gut and seeing what happens. And often what it leads to is that the entire ecosystem that's part of the cow's gut falls apart because these organisms are kind of intrinsic, intrinsically tied to a bunch of different organisms. So I think the, the maybe another strategy to trying this out would be 
keeping these organisms around, but it's just changing certain parts of their kind of metabolic machinery, if you will, so that instead of producing methane, they produce something else that's not a potent greenhouse gas. And so, it, and for us to be able to do that, we really need to kind of understand maybe the answers to the first question that, that is, why do they produce methane? And how is it coupled to important things that are happening in the cell? By knowing how those coupling reactions happen, we can essentially figure out ways to uncouple them and see if we can maybe make the cells make something else and not rely on methane as a way to do that. Um, I'm trying to simplify that, but I can go in more details. If well, that's did. fascinating because I know that for me, as someone who's respiring, I have to respire CO2 or I die because that's how I, I get energy. I take hydrocarbon chains and I combine them with oxygen and I make CO2. It's just an inevitable byproduct. But you're saying that these same organisms, it might be possible to allow them to still make a living without yeah. giving off methane. Exactly, yeah. So we're not removing the organism, we're keeping them, we're just removing a small part. Hopefully that works. Uh, it's still a work in progress. So looking ahead, and there's a question in the chat room that's pretty parallel to the question I have on my mind, which is if we use this CRISPR technology to create a new organism or a new variant of an organism and let it loose in the wild, what are some of the unintended consequences that might uh, result from that? Well, yeah, so um, yeah, it, it, is, it is important to kind of distinguish kind of what I'm mentioning here as a thought experiment from something that's actually being done. And there are, you know, ways, strategies to make sure that we can develop and deploy extremely safe strategies to do so in the future whenever we try it. I mean, one thing that I do want to mention is, um, you know, if, if and when this technology will be developed, we'll obviously kind of do a trial run on a very small scale under extremely controlled conditions to make sure what those effects might be. Um, things to think about are, you know, um, as Carolyn mentioned in her talk, ecosystems are extremely complex. And one thing is, even if we think we're changing one gene in an organism, it can have kind of dramatic ramifications on another organism. So kind of learning, you know, trying to engineer those communities in the lab, understanding how those communities change before you transplant them in an organism, are kind of ways to think ahead. I mean, these are the same kinds of things that people are thinking about for, you know, engineering the human microbiome and such. Yeah, it's a, global warming is an amazing problem in the sense that it's forcing us to consider actions that would be unthinkable, really, uh, maybe in, you know, like uh, geoengineering, uh, throwing material up into the stratosphere to block some of the sun's rays. And yet we're forced to at least think about those things because humans are being so slow to stop burning this ancient source of uh, fuel and move to what's technologically available to uh, stop harming our planet. But we've got to think about these things. And even if we do stop today, it's still important to think about this because there's warming we've locked in that uh, we've got to deal with. And if we can maybe pull the dial back a bit by modifying the methane budget, like you're, you're investigating, then it's something that we should, uh, we should be looking into. Uh, so that's fascinating. Uh, Dipti, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna shift gears one last time and uh, speak to Bethany Edwards. So Bethany Edwards is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science and she is interested in how marine microbes interact with one another and the chemical language that they use to talk to each other and the impact that has on the chemistry of the ocean and, and our climate. Her lab explores and studies a wide range of marine microbes, viruses, bacteria, phytoplankton, and microzooplankton. Lipidomic analysis is her area of expertise, looking at the collection of uh, lipids in a sample and inferring things from that. And her lab uses lipidomics to look at biomarkers of community composition, cellular stress, and environmental conditions in marine systems. And her group is also integrating metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, and transcriptomics into their laboratory experiments and fieldwork. So Bethany, can you tell us a little something about your research and what you're working on? Absolutely, thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen with you all. There we go. 
So since the Industrial Revolution, um, the ocean has absorbed something like 40% of the carbon that we've put into the atmosphere via fossil fuel burning. And this is due in part to the ocean's biology. So phytoplankton um, in the ocean, they're like tiny little plants um, and they photosynthesize and they take up CO2 um, and sequester it in the ocean. Phytoplankton are the beginning of the marine food web. So as humans with a taste for seafood, um, we might be more interested in the carbon that's transferred up the food web from phytoplankton to fish. Um, but the vast majority of the carbon fixed by phytoplankton is actually cycled through microbial communities, which are vastly complex, as we've already kind of hit on. And my lab, um, our primary goal is to untangle these interactions so that we can better understand the fate of this carbon. Um, because these microbial communities are so complicated, there's a lot of uncertainty around how much carbon is stored in the ocean, um, how long this carbon is stored in the ocean, and um, how do we predict ocean sequestration in the ocean um, using climate models. Um, so some of the questions that we can ask um, include, you know, how efficiently um, is carbon sequestered if a phytoplankton dies um, and then aggregates together and then sinks versus if a phytoplankton is eaten by a tiny microzooplankton, um, like these guys over here, or if the phytoplankton is eaten by a larger grazer like a copepod. Um, what happens if viruses infect the phytoplankton community? Um, what controls uh, bacterial degradation of dead phytoplankton um, and this recycling of that material back to nutrients and CO2, potentially methane. Um, and how do these processes vary in time and space? Um, so from year to year, over the season, um, across different ecosystems. And we can use a variety of tools to do this. Um, we can use DNA, we can use RNA, um, but what my lab specializes in is using lipidomics um, or the characterization and quantification of all the lipid compounds in a sample. This is a very powerful tool because every single living thing on this planet has a cell membrane made out of lipids of some type or another. The composition of these lipids can be used as biomarkers um, to tell us which types of organisms are present in the water column. You are probably most familiar with lipids as forms of energy storage, so things like oil, um, fats like butter, um, that COVID-15 that many of us are carrying around our waistlines these days. Those are all examples of lipids. Um, but lipids can also be uh, chemical signals. And so things like hormones, testosterone, cortisol, um, those are all lipids. And lipidomics gives us insight into um, which cells are present in the ocean, how much energy is in that system, which cells are stressed. And from that, we try to work out what the microbial community dynamics are and how that influences the fate of carbon in the ocean. And so I'm gonna tell you um, one story, give you one example of where we've employed multiple techniques to, to get at this. So um, in the summer of 2013, I went on a research cruise um, along the coast of California. And here you're looking at a satellite image of chlorophyll. Um, so just like plants, phytoplankton have chlorophyll. Um, and so we can actually see phytoplankton from space, which is really neat. Um, the darker colors here, the more warm colors, um, increase, indicate higher levels of chlorophyll, and so more phytoplankton. And so you can see that we sampled um, a very dynamic phytoplankton community. Um, we were actually able to identify a collapsing phytoplankton bloom in this region um, using genetic techniques um, such as sequencing RNA from the environment and we were able to link the decline of this bloom to viral infection. So here, um, this top panel here, you're looking at the number of free viruses floating in the environment um, because they've already killed their host and are now um, released out into the water compared to the number of viruses that are still stuck inside the cell replicating. Um, and so values um, below one 
mean that these are earlier stages of infection and values above one indicate that these are later stages of infection. And you can see that all of our samples from point rays, um, there were more free living cells, suggesting to us that this is a post-infection um, site. Whereas all of the samples from Monterey Bay um, were an earlier um, state of infection where most of the viruses were still associated with the cells. So we call this active infection. Um, and we can see that in the aftermath of this viral infection, you get a huge shift in the phytoplankton community. Um, so um, the, the, the dominant species in Monterey Bay are no longer the dominant species in Point Reyes. And this is presumably due to viruses wiping that community out. And when we look at the, the lipidomics, um, these analyses co corroborate the, the genomics. And so here we're looking at all of the lipid compounds that were extracted from all of our samples across the study site. Um, and the warmer colors indicate a higher concentration of lipids compared to other samples. And you see that there were more lipids floating around in the water column after, post, um, after infection in these pink sites. Um, and this makes sense because right, these viruses have already gone in and killed their host cracking them open and releasing um, all of their cellular material into the water. And so what does this mean for carbon cycling? Um, how are viruses actually impacting the carbon cycle? So when we started to um, take a, a deeper look at what lipids were accumulating in the surface waters, we found that there were several compounds that are actually bioactive and um, they're chemical signals um, and they impact different members of the microbial community in different ways. And so um, this is an example of one of those compounds. Um, this is dihydroxyucosapentaenoic acid. Um, say that 10 times fast, give you a dollar. Um, we um, see that the concentration of this compound, right, is much higher um, in the post-infection sites compared to the active infection sites or the non-blooming um, waters. And when we got back into the lab, we actually infected some phytoplankton with viruses um, and we observed the same compound being produced. And so this confirms for us that when we see this compound in the environment, um, it is likely associated with, with viruses um, and viral infection. We also set up experiments where we added this compound back into cultures, um, cultures with these tiny little microzooplankton grazers um, and cultures with uh, bacteria that like to colonize dead phytoplankton. And we saw that these compounds um, decreased grazing in the microzooplankton grazers. Um, some other Scientists, some other researchers um, found that the same compounds decreased the fertility of copepod grazers, so these larger um, zooplankton. Uh, but we found that bacteria responded differently. And so bacteria that were associated with sinking particles with um, dead phytoplankton, they were actually stimulated by these compounds um, and degraded the phytoplankton biomass quicker and released CO2 um, back into the environment. And so viruses in the ocean can influence the fate of carbon in a multitude of ways that we wouldn't have recognized without doing lipidomic analysis. Um, and so there's um, shunting carbon away from grazers that might export carbon to depth more efficiently. And they're shuttling that carbon towards bacteria that are recycling that biomass back to CO2. And that CO2 can exchange with the atmosphere. And so um, viruses may be decreasing the um, carbon sequestration in the, in the ocean. And this is a, a very niche um, microscopic view uh, but it is helping us understand how carbon is cycled through and stored in the ocean. And I keep doing this work because I just find it fascinating. Um, all the nuanced ways, tiny little microbes can have large global impacts. Thank you. Um, and with that, I will take questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Bethany. I mean, I, I think most of us who aren't working in that area wouldn't often think of the ocean as catching a cold. Uh, although it's probably the really stupid way of putting it, but the fact that there are these viral infections out there, and it sounds like they're affecting the ecosystem in two ways. They're directly attacking the phytoplankton, and they're also producing these toxins 
and I won't even try to say the 10, 11, something, something acid, but <laughs> they're producing these, these other chemicals that are affecting uh, other uh, critters in the ocean as well. So it's a, it sounds like a double whammy, is that right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we see, um, and I think, you know, it's important to note that this is, we're looking at one infection. We're looking at infections of a phytoplankton called diatoms. Um, but there was a paper published from some colleagues of mine um, a few years ago where they looked at infection of a different phytoplankton, um, coccolithophores, um, ones that make um, really beautiful um, blooms that you can see from space because they have calcium carbonate in their shells. Um, whenever viruses infect those, they can't make these same compounds, these lipid compounds, um, but they make other compounds um, that attract seabirds, um, ones that aerosolize um, DMS, um, and they also cause um, uh, rapid aggregation and sinking of, of particles. And so um, we can't kind of um, make a blanket statement that viruses are doing this one thing. I think virus infection, it really is very dependent on who the host is, probably dependent on who the virus is. Um, we just haven't studied it well enough to know that yet. So as someone who doesn't think about the biology all that much, I think, okay, I'm going to burn a certain amount of coal, oil, and gas, and that puts carbon into the atmosphere ocean system. And the atmosphere and the ocean, they equilibrate. And if I think about the ocean as just one homogeneous thing, then I can calculate with carbonate chemistry what fraction goes in, you know, resides in the atmosphere and how much extra the, the carbon, the uh, ocean gets rather. So how, but the ocean is actually three-dimensional and there, there's biology and there's the carbon pump. And so I just wondering if you could speak for a minute about how it is biology complicates the simple picture of a homogeneous ocean uh, and simple partitioning of our extra carbon between the atmosphere and ocean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have different ecosystems at different latitudes, um, and most of the carbon that's absorbed by the ocean, um, it really happens in these, these higher latitude regions. Um, so in the colder polar regions, there's a lot of carbon sequestration there. Um, and actually the equator um, tends to emit carbon um, back into the atmosphere. Um, and so there's, you know, the, the complication of latitude. Um, we also get um, this, um, succession of communities, right? And so um, we kind of know what our typical framework is of, you know, these diatoms, they kind of come up first um, whenever we finally get sunlight in the springtime, and then they draw down all the nutrients, and then it, the community shifts towards um, dinoflagellates, things that can do um, lots of different metabolisms, and then it shifts towards really tiny little um, cyanobacteria cells. Um, but we've seen from time series studies, so um, Hawaii, they've been studying going out to the same place every single month since 1989 and making measurements. Um, there's this study site, um, the Bermuda Atlantic time series, um, where they've done a similar thing. And they're seeing shifts in the community composition with time. And it's hard to know, you know, is that natural oscillation or more likely is that because we're now observing um, the ocean in this very detailed way during the Anthropocene, during um, this shift in climate and this increase in atmospheric CO2. So it's too early to say right now what effect the warming is going to have on these, say, viral infections or these different interactions between the components of the Bringing the ecosystem, is that right? Yeah, it's something we're we're trying to understand. Um, there's a modeling study that came out um, a few months ago that showed, you know, different virus pairs um, and virus phytoplankton pairs respond differently to increases in temperature. Um, but there was an actual physical study that went out and did a transect from um, the Azores up to Iceland, um, and they found that viruses. Um, preferred the the warmer regions um, and they couldn't quite and I think it has something to do with what you talked about earlier where chemical reactions don't go as fast um, at colder temperatures so we actually see um, more grazing um, up in the um, closer to, to the polar regions and less viral infection um, but yeah we'll have to do a lot more studies to to piece this apart right so I mean, this, this topic of this uh, night is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a science topic, 
but it's quite different from most science topics in that the people we're, we're, we're talking to today are studying you know the the wholesale uh, change of the climate of our planet and it's not a particularly happy thing and so i i wonder bethany if i could ask you and i i might ask the others as well if you would mind sharing what you worry about most with regards to global warming be it something in your specific field connected in that way or something broader because this is one of those topics that's not just um you know burying our nose in the books and, and, and running the lab and producing science papers, there are real implications for uh, all of life on this planet. So is there something in particular that, that, that bothers you the most about what's going on? Um, yeah, I mean, studying these systems in nature, um, you, you do realize that nature um, is resilient and things um, if one species dies, another species comes in and takes its place, um, but uh, that doesn't always have to include humans. Um, and so I think that the thing that stresses me out at night um, is thinking about you know, climate refugees, people who have to leave their homes because they can't keep rebuilding after a fire or sea level has, has risen so much on their island that, that they can no longer live there or hurricanes um, are a continual threat um, and, and bigger, more powerful hurricanes are, are a bigger threat. Um, so I, I definitely think that the, the ocean um, without us will, will be fine and, you know, things will evolve and we'll have species succession. Um, but obviously, you know, it's, gonna, it's not going to look like it did a um, hundred years ago, 200 years ago. Um, but, but whether humans um, will remain to be a, a big piece of the puzzle, um, I think uh, that that's debatable. Caroline or, or Dipti, if you had anything to add, anything that keeps you up at night? Um, I could go, if, unless you'd like to, Dipti. Um, go for it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, two things. One is the general loss of biodiversity that we're just seeing that things that are really weedy species that can do well in all sorts of conditions are increasing and we're losing little special species of which our beetle is just one of so many examples. But the thing that worries me the most is that we'll lose hope as a species because although what we see is really uh, troubling, we've got so many solutions and people are so excited to do something. You know, I see that here in the Berkeley undergrads who I teach in a freshman seminar on biological impact of climate change and they come and they say, what can we do? Uh, we want to know what we can do. So that's what we have to offer people, I think. And I worry that we will become so downhearted that we won't be able to give that hope anymore. Well put. Dipti, anything? Or I don't want to leave you out. If you, if you have no, a nightmare no. you'd like to share with us. Well, <laughs> I mean, there's plenty right now. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I just want to add to one thing Caroline said. I mean, I study in like in life that's invisible, the dominant. And, you know, one thing I, that concerns me is there's so much of microbial diversity that we're uncovering now that we're learning about, but we might be losing it as we learn about it. Um, and, and that's something that, that kind of bothers me a lot is, and then the, I mean, one thing that's very close to my heart, you know, personally and professionally is we know how important each of these microbes are. They might be invisible, but they, we know their global ramifications. So we might be missing something that has, that's a huge role player and something uh, important to climate without even learning who it was. Indeed. Um, this has been wonderful, Dipti, Bethany, Caroline. Thank you uh, for that great uh, overview of your, of your work. And to close, I'm going to hand the floor over to Mike Botchen, uh, Dean of the Division of Biological Sciences. Dean Botchen is Professor of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Structural Biology here at Berkeley. Having received his PhD from Berkeley in 1972, Mike was recruited back in 1980 to become an Associate Professor in Molecular Biology. His scholarly work at UC has included contributions to virology 
and to unraveling the mechanisms of DNA replication. He is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is a fellow of the American Society for Microbiology. He chaired the biochemistry section of the National Academy of Sciences and is still a member of the editorial board today. And he currently chairs the medical advisory board at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, Caroline, Dipti, Bethany, for sharing uh, with us your work and a glimpse into the next frontier of climate science. I have to say that the, that the end of the, uh, of the program left me with a lot of hope. And I think that that's, uh, that, that was a, a very nice touch there. Uh, as a dean and a scientist, I enjoy seeing our faculty always convey their excitement about their research. It's contagious and a, and a reminder of the excellence at UC Berkeley. I also want to say a special thanks to our alumni and friends who are gathering here tonight. Tonight's event is intended to shine a light on climate science, but our series of science talks more broadly help us to convey the importance of basic science. I feel very strongly that while it's essential to apply our science to solve problems like climate change, it goes hand in hand with foundational work that leads to those solutions. Basic science, that is, has always been Berkeley's greatest strength in my opinion, and must continue to be so. Your support and advocacy for Cal means everything to us and to the faculty like folks like David and Caroline, Dipti and Bethany and their incredible students. We're extremely grateful and gratified for your continued interest in Berkeley. Alma mater to many of you and the fantastic work being done here. If there's anything you want to learn more about or if you'd like to support our work for which there is indeed a deep need, especially now, please be in touch with us. We absolutely want to be part of advancing basic science and discovery at Berkeley. We want you to be a part of that. So with that, I'll say fiat lux and goodbye. <laughs>